Good Thursday morning here on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. We are back for our monthly political roundtable with a guest of the show, a friend of the show, and a third time returning guest of the show, Mr. Like Mike Lavalley. Thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. No problem, Chris. My pleasure to be here for sure. Um, just before we get into the discussion about politics in the city of Calgary, I just want to let my viewers know, traditionally we do this on Friday mornings, but uh, due to a, a special episode that's going to be coming out tomorrow morning, we have pushed this up like we've done all the other episodes, uh, monthly episodes that we do. So this is coming out Thursday instead of Friday, so that's why you're hearing it on Thursday. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the special episode tomorrow as we air it. Uh, but Mike... We are 30 days, literally 30 days from the swearing in ceremony of the new Calgary City Council, November 25th, October 25th is when they were sworn in. Um, for anyone who has, who, had, who did not listen to the candidate episodes, you were a candidate for Ward 12. Uh, how are you? How, how's it been for the last month? Did, did you pick up all your signs? <laughs> Yes, all the signs got picked up within about uh, 24 or 48 hours afterwards. Um, that was the plan. It was, a, it was unlike the campaign, it was an extremely well executed plan to pick up the signs and uh, very successful. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's uh, uh, 30 days have passed. Um, life is continuing. I know there are a number of candidates. Uh, I mean, there was a large number of candidates. We had over 100. Um, you know, we had 27 for the mayor. Uh, a number from each ward, I believe it was over 100 total candidates. So there are, uh, I was speaking with a, a fellow who works in um, HR consulting and recruitment and, and that sort of thing. And he's been contacted by a number of them because uh, a fair number of the uh, unfortunate hopefuls uh, are, are, are looking for the direction that uh, that they might be taking going forward. But uh, no, life's good. Um, settled the uh, um, more back into uh, the, my routine from uh, before the campaign and before the election. So, so things are plugging right along. Well, I, I'm glad that we have the opportunity to do this because uh, for those who don't know, Mike and I and my, my, my partner and his wife went out to uh, dinner earlier this month and we sat down, we had the, a great conversation about politics and I've asked him to come on the show as a semi-regular contributor of the show to talk about politics because he is uh, a, a sharp mind and I, I had a great conversation with him back in October when we aired our episode with him and I want Want him to continue on with the show because he has a good perspective on what is going to happen here in the city of Calgary. So, uh, Mike, once again, thank you for doing this. Um, I, I want to start off with this because this is the big thing that has been perplexing me a bit is third party advertising. Now, you did not get the endorsement of any third party advertisement the successful candidate against you did. Do you think third party advertisements played a role in this municipal election? Um, yeah, I, I think so. The, the type of role they played has certainly been debated um, during the campaign and, and since the election. But to say that they didn't play a role, I think would be, would be wrong to say that they didn't play a role uh, altogether. There was certainly, there was a lot of, uh, a, a lot of media coverage and, and, and a lot of discussion uh, around the third party advertisers. One in particular that had a, a large sum of money uh, that they had gathered previous to the campaign period to uh, promote the candidates uh, of their choice. Um, $1.7 million, I believe, approximately was the, was the figure that was used. So it's, it's kind of hard to expect that that would not have had uh, an effect on the campaign. You know, the, there is a, it's a very broad topic and it depends on who you're speaking to in terms of, uh, of whether it had uh, a lot of effect or not. And if you look at a, a number of the candidates who were supported by various third party groups without pointing any fingers at, at one, they'll say, you know, no, no, that didn't, you know, they didn't support my campaign, the, which is true because third party advertisers can, under the election back, they're not there to directly support the campaign. So for example, Chris, if you're running and I'm a third party advertiser, 
um, that's gathered funds from my group or th that I represent, then I, I don't support or donate directly to your campaign, just for the people that might be listening or watching that, that aren't really sure how that works. Um, but I can certainly um, support you and support your campaign in other ways by advertising for you on, you know, in print media or on Facebook or YouTube or any of the other, you know, popular social media channels out there. So um, to say that, that they support the campaign is, is true and not true because they don't directly provide the money. So for example, the $1.7 million uh, from Calgary's future, that they didn't take up and say, okay, we're gonna give you $50,000 for your campaign. That didn't happen. And, and, and I don't think too many people are, are pointing out that that happened or accusing them of that happen but they did directly support campaigns. So for yeah. example, if you, you know, the Facebook advertising, you know, if you're scrolling through your Facebook feed in the last month or so before the election, you saw advertisements for several of the mayoral um, candidates. Um, depending on your newsfeed, you would have seen people from in your ward as they targeted uh, geographically uh, on the areas in, in the city. So, and if they're using the picture of you that's officially released by you to them and the types of slogans and phrases that you are typically using in your campaign, while they didn't support your campaign directly by writing you a check, if they're using all the authorized things from your campaign, like your photo and, and your background and some of your platform and that sort of things, yeah, they, in effect, they have supported your campaign. So, um, so, so yeah, so there's that, and, and then there's that whole debate, done, and we've had it before, and, 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 and lots of uh, different political analysts have had that debate. Does, does money make a difference yeah. in a campaign? Is it, is it just about the candidate and their ideas, or does money make a difference? And, and there are certainly um, ideas that, that go back and forth on that. But what we'll see going into the spring is that every candidate has to declare the money that was spent on their campaign. There's a declaration form form that needs to be filed with the city of Calgary. And because we have lots of great data on exactly how many votes it got, um, we'll be able to do a comparison. Okay, here's what Canada Day spent in for their bid for mayor or for their ward councillor, and and here's how many votes they got. Um, so I'm kind of looking forward to that comparison of, of, well, let's see what it costs per vote. How effective was the campaign? Or is there a correlation between those that spent the most and those that won their seat? Now, I, I'm relatively, uh, as anyone who's ever listened to the show knows that I'm relatively new to the city of Calgary. I, I was, I, this is my first election. I was here in the city. Uh, I, I don't know what happened in 2017 or 2010 or so on and so forth. Um, were third party advertisements, tizers, uh, third party packs big in the 2017 election? Because I, I tried to do some research. Yes, there was common sense Calgary, but I didn't see a big play or was it the new financing laws that sort of changed the way that people decided that they could actually start uh, giving money into campaigns because the province has set a cap of how much money you can actually donate to a campaign. So instead of doing it that route, we can just do it the third party route. Yeah, and, that, and that's exactly what happened. And, and certain certain groups of supporters, uh, either groups or people that would typically support municipal candidates in the past. So for example, if you go back to 2017 that, that you referenced there, if, if you go back and, and look at the declarations of the campaign donors uh, for candidates from 2017, you would see, you know, a lot of, you know, $25 from Mr. Smith and, you know, $50 from Mrs. Jones and, and that sort of thing in, in the campaign donor list. But when you get into the larger amounts, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, uh, per contribution, you would you'll see those coming from businesses, and, and there'll be corporations. And and with the change in the local elections act, for example, in Ward 
uh, 12, where I lived, um, if you go back and look at it, it was in the neighborhood of, and I can't remember the exact number, I think it was 70 or 80 percent of the total campaign donations for the winning candidate came from businesses, um, primarily uh, businesses that have some money to donate and typically play a role in municipal politics, like builders and developers and those that support them, their lawyers and accountants and, and that sort of thing. So it's that is kind of not uh, uh, unexpected to see that, but where we saw a big difference and a bit of a shift in that is that those business people that would typically make their campaign donations out of their business and use it as a business expense, so to speak, that wasn't allowed under yeah. the change in the election act. So uh, I had to be personal and not as many of those owners of those businesses and corporations, the heads of those corporations dipped into their own pockets, so to speak, um, for making donations. But we saw some other organized groups that maybe didn't have a play um, before in the previous election that that now did so for example once again to pick on <laughs> i hate to pick on the one all the time but it was it made the most news because of how much money they declared prior to the election um but uh, calgary's future um raised a little over 1.7 million dollars basically from unions um uh, within the city of calgary now you can debate whether that's good or bad and some people say well they represent you know a lot of people living in the city of calgary the flip side is is that the city of calgary pays these people and we have to negotiate contracts with the unions in terms of our costs and services so if we accept campaign support from them and once again i'm not in, i'm not <laughs> accusing anybody of accepting direct money but if they supported a campaign there was a very well written letter that came out from a lawyer uh, about a month before the election and said you know, there is going to be, if you accept some support in one form or another from uh, from any group, regardless of who that group is, there's there's some sort of almost implied sort of responsibility to serve that group if they help get you elected. And, and in the case of uh, the unions from the city of Calgary, he was questioning if that was appropriate. Uh, I'm not going to put a, a comment on that or, or suggest that it was or it wasn't. But that would certainly be something for the voters to be aware of and make their own decision, for sure. So for those who uh, weren't aware, uh, it was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was the former NDP government who stopped political donations from businesses and uh, unions to uh, to uh, political parties, but also to municipal candidates. The, uh, uh, the current UCP government expanded how much personal donations you could make, but they did keep away that business and uh, unions to candidates. They did allow it to third party advertisements, but to candidates themselves we're saying no. Um, so I'm going to be interested to see, and this is just my own personal perspective here, how much money did candidates actually raise? Because when I was talking to candidates from across the city, not just in Ward 12, not just in Ward 10, they were struggling. And that could have been because of COVID-19. That could have been uh, from a lot of reasons. But the heavy donors that part of that candidates heavily relied on in the past, they dried up because like you said, the businesses weren't willing to pull out the money for their checkbooks personally, but the business would have been able to. But personally, I don't want to give you $2,000 of my own money. The business, sure, I'll give you $2,000 of my own money. But it, so I'm going to be interested in how much money actually was raised because during the election you saw a lot of the candidates say we're going to be up front we're going to be transparent about who donated to our campaigns some did and lots were and and and, and several were and, and and that's good on them um, yep. i was one um exactly you know, I list, I but i'm going to be see i'm going to be i'm going to be interested to see if that number matches up with what's actually reported, because that's where I'm going to say, okay, are you still being, are you still hiding the fact that eight people donated 250,000, which one candidate or 200, $250, but was that eight people or was that one person? And you're just trying to hide the fact that that person donated eight times at eight different events. So I'm going to be interested to see where the money came from. I follow the money in all <laughs> elections. I love when you follow the money because if 
the majority of candidates or majority of counselors right now were backed by the uh, save, El save Calgary or Calgary's future or whatever you want to call it. So I'm going to be interested to see if there's a lot of the repeat donors for a lot of those riding, a lot of those candidates as well. That's yeah, it, it, it will be interesting. And, and as you say, uh, a, a good exercise is follow the money. Follow the money will shed light on a lot of things that happen, whether it be campaign financing or things um, at City Hall and decisions that are made. Uh, following the money is never a bad thing. And I, I guess to kind of wrap up, because we'll see, we'll get more details on this going forward. We'll be able to dissect this data uh, come spring once the deadline passes for um, disclosure uh, of the yeah. financial documents. But at this point, I think that just to kind of wrap it up there, you know, there are some candidates that were, that came out, that got supported by various third party groups and said, uh, you know, no, that really has nothing to do with it. They didn't support my campaign directly. My campaign is funded from grassroots people and I'm not influenced by any organization uh, or supported by an organization. However, they, if somebody was really concerned with being attached to a third party advertising group or another organization, uh, Captain Obvious says you didn't have to accept the endorsement. You could have said, I have... don't accept your endorsement. It's, it, I, I know that's yeah. a hard statement for some people, but I agree with you. Yeah, they, they could have, they could have declined. They could not have made, they could have not made their at personal assets available for the advertising. Um, they could have said, I have nothing to do with these people and, and um, it, their endorsement is not part of my campaign. To my knowledge, I don't think there is any one candidate that was endorsed by any group, regardless of the group, that said, no, I don't want your endorsement. Um, that, that is, that's following the money and acknowledging statements like that um, sheds light on things that, uh, that are very interesting. The one last thing I'm gonna add to this before I move on is I have spoken to a few people within the city of Calgary and they've already told me they are starting packs for the next election already. They are starting the packs to start raising money to start potentially defeating some of the current incumbent councillors because that's where you do it. You don't do it through traditional donations anymore. You do it through third parties. And that's going to be sad, but people have realized after this election, you want to raise money, you do it through third parties. I've heard it as well, you know, and, and to their credit, you know, there's some groups that that wanted to support certain candidates and they were well organized. They did a good job. They followed the uh, the guidelines. They followed the new election uh, act uh, changes and they did a good job. You can't criticize them for it. They followed the rules. They did They did a great job. It was mission accomplished. So, um, so hats to a certain extent, hats off to them uh, and lesson learned for those who maybe had different ideas, so. We are always releasing new episodes and from time to time, new specials of the Cross Border Interview podcast. Be sure to hit the subscribe button wherever you are getting your favorite podcast so you never miss an episode. But also, be sure to head over to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and give us a follow. We have behind the scene looks at upcoming guests, upcoming episodes, and some special social media only content. Subscribe to the show now. And now, let's get back to our episode. Before, so I, I try to do this in chronological order, but we're going to have to jump back for the next part of the show here, because yeah. the next part of the show was, uh, is, is about our, our current Ward 4 counselor, Sean Chu. Uh, the weekend before the election, the week after the advanced voting, it, uh, CBC came out with an article that Mr. Sean Chu, while a police officer with the Calgary Police Services, had uh, assaulted a 16-year-old. The name of the girl is still unknown because it is under uh, uh, lock and key and she has not identified herself, so I do not do not know who she is. But it is a, a release that he assaulted a 16-year-old as a Calgary Police uh, Service officer and he was still elected. P 
people were upset. People went out in full force, but he was still elected with over 100 votes against his closest rival, DJ Kelly, the Ward 4 challenger. Now, this was a big thing that happened. What I'm saying is he he did something wrong. He should have... It, it should have come out a lot sooner than it did, but it didn't because people just didn't want to come forward with it. What he did was ir- like irresponsible, horrendous. I, I'm not saying that he's, a, he's, he's excused for what he did. What I will say is he was elected. He was elected by 100 votes. At the end of the day, and this is where I'm going to get, I know I'm going to get hate mail already, so please send it to crossborderphotography at gmail.com. It'll be filed away in the appropriate location. He was elected with over 100 votes. The closest person could have got 101 more votes than he did, but he didn't. He was still the duly elected representative of Ward 4. The day after the election, the calls for resignation were hard, wide, and strong. I, I will be honest, you can't ask someone to resign. Well, you can technically, you can ask someone to resign, but if they say no, you, you can't turf them from office. You can't force them from office. The only way that you can do it, which it seems like Mayor Gondek is trying to get him, get Rick McIver, Minister of Municipal Affairs to call a by-election. It's not gonna happen. Sean no. Chu has to resign by himself. Before we talk about the next steps, what was your initial thought on this whole, I, I'm going to call it a shit show that the the council has sort of been dealing with for the last month. Yeah, um, first of all, I mean, it happened before and the count before they were even sworn in, you know, councillors were coming out and having, you know, the mayor certainly did uh, take a stance on it and refused to swear him in. Um, councillors, uh, a number of councillors, a majority of councillors came out and took a, took a stance on it and, and made comments about it. Um, what we had is a very emotionally charged issue for sure. Um, I'm not going to pretend to know the ins and outs of it. I wasn't there 30-ish years ago uh, yeah. when these uh, incidents happened. I know they have been and it's been reported in the press that they have been investigated in the past and there's various reasons why it didn't come up before but this also isn't mr chu's first term uh, as a counselor he's been a counselor for a while now um and the the acts that happened did not happen during his term as a counselor it's not while he was fulfilling his duties as a counselor and and if you look through the Elections Act and eligibility to be a candidate for a, a municipal office position, such as councillor or mayor um, in the province of Alberta, there is nothing in there that this would disqualify a candidate based on actions or inactions or convictions or lack of convictions that happened previous to them being uh, an elected official. Now, had these actions occurred while Mr. Chu was in a, a, an elected position, while he was a counselor, then you it would be very different. You'd be seeing things from, um, because they've consulted a lot of lawyers on this. There's, there, there's no doubt that the, the legal fees have been paid on this topic. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where Mr. McIver has come up because he would have had a lot of legal advice on this. And if it happened while he was in his term uh, as a counselor, then there can be some things that happen. Um, but even if you go back to the Joe Maglioka situation, uh, now Joe didn't get reelected, um, but Joe arguably committed some fraud uh, while he was uh, a counselor. He misrepresented expenses and it's you know the rcmp have decided to go ahead and press charges and still it did not disqualify him so when you look when you go to the sean chu situation um there's nothing that he did or didn't do that would disqualify him from being a candidate and and the way i look and for perfect example look at um 
um, the gentleman who's in jail basically ran his campaign from jail because Kevin Johnson. Away. Yeah, Kevin J. Johnson. Thank you for updating my memory there for a second. Um, but yes, uh, everybody was aware of that. But yes, he was still an eligible candidate. He paid his fee, got his nomination signatures, filed his papers with the city of Calgary. He was eligible to be a candidate. Doesn't matter what he had done or even that he was serving a term in jail while the campaign was going. By law, by law, yeah. he was still eligible to be a candidate. And that's exactly where we are with Mr. Chu, regardless of how you feel about Mr. Chu. By law, he is an eligible candidate and he received more votes than the person who did not win. Yeah. So he is the elected official for his work. I, I am going to say something just for clarification's sake and just to cover my ass here for a second. Joe Maglioka, the former Ward 2 counselor, has not been found guilty in a court of law for any fraud <laughs> apprehended yeah. to the, uh, the people of yeah. the city of Calgary. While the yeah. internal investigation at the city of Calgary did find out that he was, RCMP has not charged him or has charged him, but has not been found guilty yet. There's yes. covering my ass here for a second. <laughs> yes. Subtle distinction, but well done. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I want to talk about. Uh, I want to ask the question, and I, I'm going to preamble it for a bit here. Since that election, there has been a lot of talk in my circles about electoral reform. Do we deserve an election where the person who wins receives more than 50% of the vote? I'm in favor of ranked balloting. I've always been in favor of ranked balloting where you bal you rank your choices from one to however many candidates and the person with 50% wins. I think that's what the city of Calgary needs. I think that's what municipalities need because I don't like the fact that there is a, uh, uh, an elected official right now who has received 27% of the vote where his closest challenger received 27% of the vote and it was the difference between five or six votes. I, I just believe that if we are going to have true democracy, true representation, you need to represent more than 50% of the population. That's my opinion. What's yours on it? Um, yeah, it's certainly, um, you know, as far as that rank balloting, I mean, that, that would be a way to, to help with that. Um, I, I, and even in the wards, you know, we, we were just talking about you know, Mr. Chu's situation where there's only a few differences, a few votes uh, difference uh, in the voting. And there was a couple of uh, wards like that, if my memory serves me correctly, where the voting was very close. But we also had low, generally in the city of Calgary, we had low voter turnout as well. We were under 50% uh, in voter turnout. So even in wards where there was a significant spread, like there was a clear winner in terms of who got the most votes, there's certainly an argument that could be made that they're not really representing the majority of the people in that ward. Yeah. So, for example, if I, I'm aware of a ward where, you know, there were eight candidates in the ward. And even though one person won uh, the, for counselor, there were more people that voted for somebody other than that person who won then actually voted for the counselor who won by a large margin by the way we we measure the votes yeah so when you look at it 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 could be argued that the majority of the people in that ward wanted somebody else yeah. so yeah back to your point i mean that's going to be an interesting one going forward and it would have to be addressed on the provincial level because our municipal elections are run by the provincial act so well just in that case as well 20 25 of the 26 candidates got more votes than the person who won the mayorship <laughs> right yeah so yeah. It, it it goes back to the fact of can you truly represent all your constituents when more people did not want you compared to want at you? So that's my, that's, that's. Well, and, I, and it's a good point. And it's something for, for those people that are watching your or listening and or watching your, your <laughs> podcast, um, you know, it, it's a good point to remember and, and bring up to your, regardless of what area of the city that you live in, um, have a look at those figures. 
And the job of that counselor is to represent everybody in their work. They can't, they're not to go in and say, okay, I'm elected. So now I'm going to push forward. I have the mandate to push forward my ideas. That's really not how the municipal politics are, are designed to work. You're there as a representative for people in your ward. And so if, when you look at the numbers and, and people living in those wards should look at their numbers as well and say, hey, there was, you know, there was a lot of candidates here and somebody was interested, most of the people were interested in somebody other than this. Hold your counselor's feet to the fire and make sure your voice is, is being heard um, because they are your representative and it's their job to represent you whether you voted for them or not. Um, that, that is a duty that they agreed to take on uh, as counselor, regardless of how many votes they got. So um, don't be afraid to, to stand up and, and make your voice heard to your counselor. By all means, I encourage everybody to do that and be, be involved and participate. I couldn't agree more. I've always been an advocate for democracy. Um, if you did not vote in the last municipal election, you do not get to complain about taxes, about snow removal. While you will still probably, you did not voice your opinion where it mattered the most at the ballot box. So I, I hope people uh, take that into consideration when tweeting or Facebooking or Instagramming or TikToking or whatever the heck you want to, whatever the new thing is in five weeks. But I, I, I hope people do take it into consideration that democracy only happens when people vote. And with a voter turnout of lower than 50%, come on, guys, like seriously. Uh, I want to jump back onto Sean Chu for two seconds before we move into one of the most pressing issues that the city of Calgary thought was important to the people of Calgary. Um, where does Sean Chu go from here? In your opinion, does he stay on? Does he go off and take a, a winter walk like Trudeau did in the 1980s? What <laughs> does Sean Chu do? Does he become just a quiet voice on council for the next four years? If I'm Sean Chu, what would I do? I yeah. guess might be another way to, to phrase that. Yep. Um, John Chu is the elected official. Uh, he's the elected representative of the people in his ward. I think Sean Chu, as the elective representative, just to circle back to, I said, it's the job of people who are elected to represent in their ward. Regardless of the controversy that's swirling, I would advise him to do the best he possibly can to represent people in his ward do a good job, be a representative for the people in the best possible way that you can going forward. Now, we heard from a lot of council candidates, and there's lots of them across the city, as well as a lot of the mayoral candidates, how dysfunctional the previous council was because they were divided and they, you know, we had to saw the, the bickering and the arguing and the different things. And, you know, this council, before they were even sworn in, were dividing council and putting their feelings about a particular elected councillor ahead of the facts of how the election works and that that councillor was going to be representing the people of their ward. But we put the feelings before the facts of what happened during the election. And it started dividing the council before they were even finished sworn, being sworn in. So uh, some of... Uh, words of advice, I guess, to, to Mr. Chu, and, I, and I'm not here to advise Mr. Chu on anything, and, I, and I'm not taking a stance for or against him, but when you look at the facts of the Electoral Act and the fact that he is the elected official and there really is no lever to pull, to remove him from that office because we don't like him, um, because we don't like somebody isn't a reason to have them removed uh, uh, as a councillor. And, and I think some of the elected officials for council have forgotten that, that they put their feelings before the facts and their feelings before what their job is to do. And just because you don't like somebody um, is not a good reason to do it. Now, so you know, they started trying to make it so he can't sit on committees and stuff like that. Wouldn't they have done better to 
to put him to make him work even harder instead of giving him a free pass. I mean, it's like if somebody mis, uh, misbehaves at work, it's like giving them paid leave. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you get as much as you can out of this yeah. individual who has more council experience than the majority of council right now? Um, put them to work. Work them hard. Absolutely. And, I, I, I and, couldn't... If, and if you don't like him and if you don't like that he's elected, change the process. Work to change the process. Work to change the rules. But he followed the rules. He can't take it all out on him. This is my final statement on this one before we move into the next topic here. Those in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. I'm going to challenge every single one of the other councillors and mayor to release their police record. Open it up. If you are clean, you should have nothing to hide. I want to see if any of the councillors have a DUI. I want to see if they've been speeding in school zones. Let's open it up. If the purity test is now in place that you cannot be charged by cops, then I want to see it. I want to see it on record. And I every time a new counselor comes on the show, I will ask them that question. Have you been charged by the Calgary Police Services for any crime? And if you have nothing to hide, you should be able to answer that correctly and quickly. But if you have been charged with a DUI, there are many people who have lost loved ones to DUIs. Let's, let's have it out on the table. Let's have the purity test out for all of them, not just one. That's my final word on that. One, one and the same for everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm behind that, except I'm not defending anybody in particular, and I'm not pointing too many fingers at anybody in particular, but let's make sure that same litmus test is applied evenly. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I'm not defending what Sean Chu did because it, like I said, it's inexcusable and it's, it's horrendous, but I'm saying that I don't know all these other counselors back. Like you said, Sean Chu was elected uh, with this in his background. Who else did, what else did we elect in October? There's my final word. Is, is it the first time in history we've had a slimy politician? I'm just going to leave that question out there. <laughs> Amen to that. So we we will jump forward now because uh, during that same week when everything was going down with Sean Chu, uh, Mayor Gondek announced on, I think it was Ryan Jesperson or another uh, news outlet that the first priority for this council will be declaring a climate emergency. Journalism is in crisis, and our mission here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast is to tell the story that isn't being told. It is vital that independent journalism survives with the rise of fake news. Every penny that is contributed to the Cross Border Interview Podcast goes to help continue our work to tell people's stories. All of our content is produced and edited by our team. The Cross Border Interview Podcast provides entirely free content, and we will never hide stories behind paywalls. By supporting a new model of journalism, our listeners, like you, are supporting real, independent journalism. Consider making a monthly donation via our Patreon account, or make a one-time donation by Interact eTransfer. Now, let's get back to the show. I sat down with a lot of candidates in my in my in in this August, September, and October. Not one of them said my first priority, which I asked all of them, "What's your priority?" Not one of them said climate change, climate emergency was their top priority when elected. We are a oil and gas community. We are built on oil and gas. Uh, I know there's been a big push to move to trans uh, renewable uh, uh, energy. But is this what the people of Calgary voted for? No. Why not? How's that for an answer? No, it's not. Um, and they're, to be fair to a, a number of councillors, there were um, a number of them that had lines to the effect of 
addressing climate change as as part of their platforms. Um, certainly, um, you know, in terms of maybe reaching some goals of you know net zero at some point in the future, working towards that, or um, in the interest of uh, our city doing doing our small part to impact on it. You know, there's are there things that we can do from a municipal policy standpoint that that help ad address the issue. And and so there are a number of candidates that that had those sorts of ideas in their platforms. But to my knowledge, and I read as many of the councillor platforms as you did and watched the debates and read the the interviews and the questions and there were uh, none that I can recall um, that and once again that I recall I am I I'm open to be fact checked on that for sure but uh, that said you know the first thing I'm going to do is declare a state of climate emergency uh, for the city of Calgary um, there is nobody that said that was their priority and their number one thing to do yet that is exactly what happened um, and I'm not even sure that it was after it was post being sworn in before some started speaking about it. Um, so it was by far and away the first thing. Um, you know, a, a couple of comments, I guess, uh, on that. And we have a it's a very new council. Um, not a lot of our existing um, city council has experience um, either in um, municipal politics or, or sometimes even in within large organizations or corporations. So they there's a lot of enthusiasm and energy and they're fresh off a campaign and they want to get in there and make a difference. Absolutely. I understand that they're they're coming in on on a high. They, they you know, they just won an election for a lot of them. It was their first time uh, running and 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 they were successful. So you know, hats off to them. You know, they're <laughs> they're riding the wave right now. Um, there is also a, as that happened and they got sworn in, and because this kind of happened even before they went through council school and learned about the things that they're, you know, how to proceed on a day to day basis working for the city of Calgary as a councillor. You know, they 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 jumped on this climate emergency, and I think it was out of enthusiasm to want to do something and make a difference uh, right away. And they really didn't know what else to do. Um, how many times did you interview a candidate uh, and you asked the question, you know, okay, what's your first day? What's your first week look like? Uh, should you be fortunate enough to win the election? There were a number that didn't really even know what the answer to that kind of question might be. So in their enthusiasm to get in there and want to make a difference and and, and when the, the idea gets suggested, they kind of hop on that bandwagon and hey, here's something I can do right away. It had nothing to do with your platform and, <laughs> and what you what, what you discussed previous to the election. I think it, pro it probably caught some people sort of blindsided. So that would be one comment I would sort of make on that, that there's a lot of enthusiasm to want to do something right away. And when that issue came up, they saw it as something that they could jump into and you know kind of hang their hat on and sometimes the enthusiasm for that can can overshadow the fact that maybe it's not the right thing to do um <laughs> just because we can do something doesn't always mean that we should do something well i'm going to interrupt for a second because you and i are both business guys you and i both know that businesses happen and you have to set a plan i I read the declaration of a climate emergency. I don't know if they know what they've done. And I'm not trying to be rude or throw shade at anyone, but when, as a business owner, which a lot of people understand that the city of Calgary is a business, it's the corporation of the city of Calgary. It is a business. You run it like a business. If you can't tell me and I've not spoken to any councillor, I've not spoken to the mayor, I've not spoken to anyone in this new administration yet. If they can't tell me how this declaration is going to affect my taxes, is going to affect the budget, is going to affect the day-to-day -day decisions, which administration has basically come out and said, we don't know what we're doing with this now. 
I, I am concerned that the next four years or the next year when everyone's trying to learn the ropes here is going to be a mess because we have now declared something that we don't know the ramifications of. Yeah, and, and I think, absolutely, I think you've, you've made a very good point there. And the, I've read some of the feedback because there's been a lot of comments back and forth in social media uh, on this. And, and, and the people that supported the declaration of a climate emergency said, you know, it's a signal to the world. Um, this isn't costing us, it's just a declaration. It's a signal to the world that we acknowledge things with, with climate control. And even, and some of the more official talk or the formal speak around council chambers. And, you know, there was an op-ed uh, penned by a couple of the councillors and, and the new mayor um, as to why they push forward with this um, so quickly. Uh, frankly, I mean, this was right out of the chute. Um, that, you know, as a signal to the rest of the world that we're serious about climate and they want to attract that that investment in the change in the future that's coming and and they they make pretty much made it sound like there is lots of money billions of dollars waiting to be invested that we're missing out on because we didn't declare a climate emergency and other municipalities around the world either in Canada North America around the world did and that, and that the uh, they insinuated that the investment was going there with that i understand to make that argument but i have yet to see an example of one piece of investment that went somewhere because a municipality declared a climate number give me an example of that you know, don't talk about that it could be out there. Let's see an example of something we lost out on because we hadn't declared a climate emergency and somebody else had. That, that would have been a more powerful argument than yeah. just saying we want to send a signal to the world. And, and, and that signal to the world, that phrase that they used uh, in that, in declaring a climate emergency, it, it's, it, for some reason, it just rung up. It was like hitting a symbol. It went off in my head and it was like deja vu. And I started thinking to myself, where have I heard this before? And we have heard this before. We heard this with our previous provincial government buying social license. We wanted, they were insisted that it was going to be good for Alberta and good for our business and good for oil and gas if we stepped up and sent a signal to Canada and a signal to the world that we're serious about climate change and we are going to institute a carbon tax ahead of being on the province, ahead of it being mandated by the federal government, because that's a better thing to do. It'll give a social license. That term was used a lot. We haven't heard that term in the last year or two. Um, it just hasn't been a phrase that's being used much more, but it was definitely a sexy phrase that was being used back then is buying the social license. Um, so we put in a carbon tax and started taxing ourselves to death because the idea was that we we're going to say, hey, look, this is how serious we are. We have good products. You know, if you replaced coal in the world with our natural gas product, emissions would be reduced dramatically. It would go a long way to achieving our climate change goals. And we can support that because we have the best technology. You know, even our coal-fired plants had the best technology and we're the cleanest plants. We'd have been done better as a province to educate and use our technology and sell our technology to those in other parts of the world that are opening coal plants as we speak to go, here's an example of what we did. And this is a you know, best in class example. And we could have led the world that way, but instead we tried to do it by sending a signal yeah. to the world and, and trying to buy social license. And how well did that work? It didn't. It didn't at all. We didn't yeah. get pipelines. We didn't get extra investment. Things in the um, in our natural gas and oil sector are still being sold off today. But, uh, even though this happened a number of years ago. So this whole climate emergency, and we're going to get investment because we've declared a climate emergency, really sounded familiar to me 
to a previous government's declaration of, hey, we're going to send a signal and get social license because we're doing better. And we didn't learn the lesson that that didn't work. People didn't buy it. It just wasn't there. But to be, to play devil's advocate here, because uh, uh, we have been under a new government for the last two years. And anyone who knows me uh, knows that I'm married to the former minister of tourism under the Alberta NDP. But anyone who's listened to the show knows that I'm not a NDP uh cheerleader i'm not an ndp uh vocal uh, opponent i like to look at it from both sides jason kenny has not done any better even no. withdrawing the uh carbon tax yes we got uh amazon here yes that seven billion dollars that he's all excited about that is going to be invested in this uh, community but it's not like there's businesses beating down the door in Calgary or Edmonton or across Alberta to say, hey, we want to set up shop here because you, you've you canceled your carbon levy. And I know the federal carbon levy is still there, but we understand that you're an amazing environmental record here in Alberta under the conservative government. So you're damned yeah. if you do, you're damned if you don't, it seems like. In this province. Oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> I, I agree with you 100%. I don't think that's really playing devil's advocate. I think it's making more of the point is that the, we hurt ourselves financially in trying to send one signal. It didn't work. We've pulled it and arguably are we better off? Who knows? Um, it's still still there, but things haven't really improved. So it really didn't make a difference one way or the other. So to send the signal to the world that we're declaring a climate emergency, I'm questioning how effective that strategy is really going to be given this discussion we've just had. Yeah. And some of the arguments that happened, well, you know, it's more of a, symbolic type thing it's not really costing us any money well hold on i mean two days after they declared the climate emergency administration came back to council and said well hey if we're going to have this and these are the goals now we need to hire more people and we need to manage this we need to do a better job it came out um two days might be mis misinterpreting that but i'm going to say within a week yeah of the declaration of the climate emergency uh, administration said back at hey here's what it's going to cost just because you've declared the climate emergency we need staff to do this um they hit up council immediately for for money so for those that said it's a symbolic nature and it's not going to cost us any a symbolic gesture that's not going to cost us any money that's just not true which is a perfect segue into our later our uh, next topic which is um We'll talk about the budget first before we talk about the last subject here. Um, so it uh, administration proposed a 1% uh, hike in taxes to cover operational costs for the next uh, four years, uh, for the next year, I should say. Uh, they are like literally we are recording this Monday night as this is coming out Thursday. So they have just been uh, sitting through council and budget deliberations most of the day about what council and what ci uh, citizens want. And it looks like we're potentially heading to a 3% increase. Do not quote me on that because it could have changed by Monday to Thursday. So yet again, this is the worst thing about recording these way too early. Things could change, it, but I have to because I need to make sure that I'm doing my job correctly and I'm making sure that these are out on time. Um, if I'm a business, if I make a major change like declaring a climate emergency or making an, an announcement that we are going to be investing as a business into X company or X service, everything now has to change. You, you are now officially changing the na name of the game. And you've already mentioned it briefly here, which you have to hire new staff to look after this. Administration doesn't know what this means. So they're, they're scrambling to try and figure this out before the budget's passed. Should they have waited to declare this emergency after they pass the budget? Or are we, like, again, are we damned if we do and damned if we don't? How how does the budget fit into this whole perspective of this new council and everything that has transpired within the first 30 days of this new administration? Well, 
Oh, geez, there's a big topic. But um, to answer one part, uh, you said, you know, you kind of posed the question, should they have declared the emergency before or after budget deliberations? And, and, and what they're talking about this week is adjustments to the current, because the budget was set. So they're looking at adjustments to that current budget for 2022, because as you know, it was set in that four year cycle. And then after this discussions this week, we're gonna get into deliberations on the next four years going forward and setting that. So it's the mid cycle adjustment, I believe is the term that they use that they're discussing yeah. this week for the last year. Um, and, I'll say that they did the right, if you're going to declare, I'm not saying they did the right thing by declaring a climate emergency, don't get me wrong. But if you are going to declare a climate emergency, uh, I believe, and I don't think they did this consciously, but I think it's a, it, it's a good thing to have done it before the discussions about the mid cycle um, budget adjustment because now we can bring forward and put on the table, okay, what does this mean in terms of dollars and cents uh, to the city of Calgary? Had they waited until after the budget deliberation, so if we'd have went through uh, the mid-cycle uh, adjustments this week, and then later on, we're gonna go through the next four years, uh, that's going to happen before the end of our calendar year here. Um, there's a lot of budget talks uh, scheduled to happen in, in the coming days. If we'd have waited until after all of that, uh, because it's going to cost us money, it's just a matter of how much it's going to cost us money. And and for those that that were supporting the idea by saying, you know, that's going to bring dollars and business into the city, you know, we we should quantify that a little bit. Like, wh wh how much do we think is coming in, and where is it coming from? And so it's right to have that declaration before that discussion of the budget because it's going to factor in to those budget things. Had we had all the budget deliberations and then said, okay, now we're going to declare a climate emergency. Well, you've already set the budget. Okay. And now we're talking about something that's going to cost us a bunch of money or for those that are proponents of it, it's going to make us a bunch of money. I don't think that's going to happen, but for those that are proponents, I'll give them their, their, they're due that, that you know that's the, the idea they're putting forward it, it's best to make that declaration and have this all up front better than bring it in later i mean that I, i'm a glasses half full kind of guy so uh, <laughs> i'm trying to pull something positive out of the climate emergency but uh uh at least it's been done before budget discussions so that we can get these factors on the table and we know what it's going to cost so you, you you ran in the last election. I'm assuming you looked at the budget. You know that the city finances are not in the best shape. We are struggling right now. We have two major, if not the biggest infrastructure projects on the table for the next four years. Green yeah. Line Phase 1, which goes from yep. uh, south, which is Ward 12, to 16th yeah. Avenue. I'm, st I, I, I'm not even sure if the city knows if it's going under the river, over the river, or like like w what's happening there. But Okay, well, I can help you out with that. Okay. So basically, Phase 1 is running from um, Shepherd, which is uh, in Ward 12. Yeah. Uh, it's just 130th. If anybody knows the city and they're driving down there, it's where the Home Depot and the Lowe's and everything there. So just north of there, um, up to, and the current part of phase one goes to downtown. Yeah. Uh, so it includes the construction to downtown, the tunneling downtown, and the last station would be actually the construction of the Eau Claire station under the current plan. Phase two is yet to be decided based on their ability to stick to budget in phase one. I'm just gonna leave that for what it's worth. <laughs> but phase two uh, was planned to go over the river by a bridge uh, from the Eau Claire station. That, and that's why Eau Claire station is being designed and built as it is, because it's gonna support a bridge that crosses from roughly Eau Claire uh, to the top of uh, uh, the hill on the other side on the north side of the river and then go up to 16th avenue so our current approved construction is that basically that downtown to shepherd industrial uh section of of the green line so so that's underway uh the funding is in place from provincial and federal governments 
on that. If we do a good job of managing that funding, then we'll see more of the green line because we'll be able to afford um, the next phase and whether and where that next phase should go as you know because we've had conversations on this i have some extremely strong opinions on what would be best for the city as far as where that next phase goes i know my opinions are not in line with those of our current mayor um she advocated very much so the other way and basically her, her, her premise was that once again um if, where have you heard this before because it'll send a signal to those um in the north part of the city that we're not abandoning them in in terms of transit um there's a theme forming here very early in this administration on sending signals yeah um sending signals can be extremely expensive and i'd like to see the payoffs and the benefits of sending the signals rather than just it be a warm and fuzzy feeling feelings should not be trumping facts and what are you wow, talking about what? mike come on feelings are feelings are all the rage in 2021 didn't you know that i know I, I call, call me crazy i'm loopy i'm out there but uh the it, let's let's have facts uh trump feelings and, and look at what uh, what's better overall but I, i'm gonna get off of that but uh but yes uh, the, so we have the green line happening and because i cut you off in the middle of that the event center the event center which went to the planning and uh, development uh, planning planning commission earlier on last week uh yep. it has been approved um yes. which <laughs> I, I hate to hark back to the environmental declaration that we made but there was a lot of people pissed off that this uh, the planning commission did not take into consideration that declaration of the environment uh, climate crisis that we are currently under because it would have cost us one billion dollars not what the current price tag is but it would have cost us more to emulate a uh, an arena like the seattle climate change arena which is the worst name of an arena i've ever heard of for a nhl hockey team to play in but let's leave it there um this event center new arena looks we won't even talk about the looks because it, it's it's horrendous and it 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 looks like a box on top of a box i think the best thing that i've ever heard is it's lego pieces um yeah. you you've looked at the budget can this council do anything for the next four years with two major projects underway yes if you, if you look at those projects and we'll, we'll, well i'll start with the green line because yeah. uh, that's the easiest to handle first is that um the funding for that uh, we're, we're getting tremendous value for the dollar uh on the green line because to speak in rough in rough kind of napkin math uh, basically about the green line um we're getting all the benefit from it um, and we're and it's costing us basically one third of the price is, is what we're we're putting into it. Roughly a third coming from provincial government, uh, roughly um, a third coming from federal government. There's certainly the argument can be made that geez, those are all three levels of government. There's only one taxpayer. But for the I'll, I'll also I'll counter that argument with that, you know, particularly with the federal money for those that are tired of seeing our federal dollars being spent in Quebec rather than in Alberta, then, then yeah, this is a way of claw, clawing back on that a, a little bit. So, yeah. so yeah, even though there is one taxpayer, there is a certainly advantages to pulling from the rest of the province uh, and from the federal government as well. So the, you know, we're going to see things like um, better mobility, better transit, um it, it puts our city in a better light because we have a better public transit system it provides some service to some areas of the city that are not getting serviced uh right now uh, effectively at all uh and it's basically costing us 35 cents uh on, on the dollar so as far as the as the line goes the yeah we can we can move forward on that and should move forward on that and, and okay. find a way because because we are leveraging that other money um the event center uh, we need something to a city needs a place to hold events 
whether it be you know a, a pro sports team um or big concerts or or whatever and if you look at some of the other places we've spent uh money and th there's a lot of talk about bringing people you know improving calgary sending a signal to the world uh, about Calgary, that's a great place to come, and there's things to do here, and people want to be here, and all that sort of thing. And 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 I love the Saddle Dome. I like it's iconic. I think it, it, it's part of Calgary. It's a great part of history. And but it's getting old, and all buildings have a, a lifespan. Uh, at at some point, you know, and it's it's been flooded. It, it, uh, you for you're fairly new to Calgary, but not only has it has the building served us well, but it served us well through some hard times. Yeah. Um, the water was well into the lower bowl section of seats uh, during the uh, the floods uh, that we suffered a few years ago here in Calgary. So the fact that we're even still using it now and it's very effective. And I've been to a Flames game this year, and you know people are there and they're having a good time and they're and they're getting behind something and they're cheering for the Flames. I think that that's a good thing. Yeah. You know, we we have spent money on other areas in the past in the city that have given us iconic things to to point to your comment about you know the look of the facility that, that you know maybe the styling isn't you know it's it attractive but i don't think people come there because necessarily because the the building looks better um the flames aren't going to play any better if the arena looks cooler on the other side um you know what yeah, are you I talking think, about mike come on <laughs> of course they're going to play better <laughs> That, that, that's the businessman coming out in me is that it, it what happens inside isn't going to be predicated by how it looks on the outside and as a taxpayer i'm okay with it not looking whiz bang the the flashiest thing ever because i'm paying for it if it gets the job done and replaces a building that's nearing end of life and has been through a major disaster and is going to keep us as a city in focus in major sports teams, you know, around North America, certainly for sure, and give us the ability to host events and, and bring people into our city. I'm okay with that. Now, and, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna preface that with and make a comparison to another thing that we really did over the top do a great job on, and but it cost us a lot of money, and that's the new city public library. It's only been open for a short period of time now. And yes, it gets rave reviews from architectural and travel and that sort of thing about how great it looks and everything. But you know what? And I've brought this up before. We spent millions and millions and millions of dollars on our new library. I have yet to hear anybody from outside of the city of Calgary. And we're trying to draw people in because drawing people in helps our city. It helps our, uh, our entertainment business, you know, our restaurants, our, our hosting business, our hotels, travel, WestJet, which is based out of Calgary. It's a Calgary company. All these sorts of things are really good to have events here. I know lots of people from other parts of the province, from other parts of Canada and across the U.S. Not one of them has ever made the comment, and I've never even made a comment in a news or report anywhere. You know, I went on holidays to Calgary last year because I had some really great tickets to something at the library. It doesn't happen. But it does for things like a playing scheme. It does for things like even with our um, old and inadequate building, uh, the Saddle Dome, when Garth Brooks came to town, the seats sold out in like three minutes and they had to put extra shows in that brought people from all over Western Canada into Calgary and supported our hotels. So is it going to be a bit of a struggle because we do have budgetary issues going forward? Absolutely. Um, the declaration that came in in the last two weeks uh, about the climate emergency this event center has been in planning stages for way longer than two weeks for them to make an adjustment and say okay now this is going to meet your because city council doesn't even know what the climate emergency is and how we're going to meet it. administration doesn't know what they're going to have to put in place that's why they're asking for more staff and more things to analyze this and what do we got to do to meet our targets under this new direction 
the timing just wasn't there. If we're going to move ahead with this and moving ahead, if we want to do it, it's going to be less expensive to do it sooner than later. Everybody recognizes that. We recognize that with the Green Line. We recognize that with the event center. Um, it's just not physically and logistically possible to accommodate all those things, stay within budget and go forward. So yes, as an outsider, it's easy to make that comparison and say, geez, we just declared a planning emergency. And now this building maybe doesn't support some of those ideas, but holy cow on the timing. Like this is a huge project with, yeah. you know, hundreds of people working on it. That That's a big ship that's already cruising down the ocean. It's hard to turn around real quickly. Looking to get your message out? Looking to get your product heard about? Have an upcoming event in the province of Alberta. For as low as $50 per week, you can now advertise on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Reach out today by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca and click on Advertise Now. If you book your advertisement during the month of December, you will get 50% off. Now, let's get back to the episode. Um, I'm going to quote a British rock band right now. I just can't get some satisfaction in this town. And it doesn't seem like the, the people of Calgary are either. Um, the satisfaction survey came out earlier this month as well. I know the worst dad joke you could possibly ever imagine was just said on the cross border interview podcast, but Mike, Lack of satisfaction. What's your thoughts on the survey? <laughs> um, it, it's interesting. I don't think there was a whole lot of surprises uh, in, in the survey. Um, but I want to take a step back because not surprisingly, there are not a lot of people that are aware that the city of Calgary, the administration surveys basically itself in terms of just like you get surveys every time you buy something, every time you shop somewhere, every time you order something online, you are bombarded with, hey, how was your experience? And that, and that survey goes from there. Um, it's basically the equivalent of the city doing itself, but they also ask a lot of questions on there. And, had, and I don't know if you've had a chance to sit through one of the surveys. I've actually been surveyed a couple of times. So uh, I've, I've, I'm really familiar with it in, in, in a lot of detail. And it takes about, I think, I'm going to say 40 minutes to answer it over the phone with a number. Oh yeah, it's not a short, this is not a two minute thing that comes out. There are a lot of questions and a lot of ranking on how are we doing in different areas? Should the city be spending less, the same or more uh, in these areas? And then administration and council use that survey a lot. And some of the ways that the questions are answered they can you know if they're struggling to say okay you know if we're going to adjust budgets or if we need to ask for more money in different areas you know this is what citizens told us it came out in the survey that they'd like to see less emphasis here and more emphasis in another area so that's another way that the survey gets used and it's a and it's a long document that with all the details that goes into it uh and you can download it from from the city of calgary site so it, it's it's very interesting to go through it because the counselors will say, to come back to your point, it looks like maybe we might be headed for a larger tax increase than what we've had. And they'll look back and they'll look at the results of the survey and say, well, but people have told us this is where they are okay with us spending more money. So we use this survey to guide us there. Um, but what a lot of people don't realize, and and most counselors, I bet you, if, if you were to ask them, but without them seeing this brought this podcast or hearing this podcast um, about the details of the surveys, that in some ways it's basically flawed, especially about um, the spending questions. Um, and and it's been this way for a number of years because I know I've been surveyed more than once from the city of Calgary, Lucky. and it's not a fun <laughs> thing because I've heard the survey and and the preamble. And when they phone, it comes up on the phone as city of Calgary is phoning, and they say that they're you know they're they're interested in in you being part of the survey. And the very first thing they ask is they say, are we speaking to the youngest person in the household who is over the age of 18? That is the very first question. 
If you aren't, they aren't interested in talking to you. They want to talk, they want to, talk to the person in the household that is the youngest person over the age of 18. So of voting age, but the youngest person in the household. So how does that not skew some of the answers that are coming back on the survey? I, 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 would, I would love to have an in-depth conversation with this on people who are professional pollers and, and surveyors. Um, that would know a lot on and, there, and there's a couple of people I know in the community who that is that is their business and and, and I, I'd love to have a detailed conversation on this with them because in my opinion I think it's basically a flawed survey now the, the, the last stat I heard is that roughly one in three adult children under the age of 30 are still living at home um, because of housing affordability and employment situations, and, and, and it's probably even come up since COVID, but we have multi-generational families living in a household. So I think we have more of that going on now than we ever have ever had in the past. And when you ask to speak to the youngest person in the household, I'm willing to bet you're also going to be speaking with the person least likely to have been paying the tax bill. Yeah. I, I don't know that for sure. That's a gut feeling. And I'd be willing to be fact-checked on that. But if you had a household with somebody that is, you know, a, a, a husband and wife that are maybe in their late fifties and they might have a, a um, kid going adult, to state. Yep, adult adult family, adult age family in their early 20s or late 20s, they're over the age of 18. My bet is that they would be answering the survey questions when asked, but they're also not paying the taxes. So a lot of those questions on how satisfied with your service are, should we be spending less, more, or the same on that service? Those questions you're asking people that don't really have a dog in the fight um, because they're not paying the bill on it, but yet we're asking their opinion on whether we should be spending more of the same or less. So I'm a little bit critical. I, I, I applaud on one hand, I applaud the city of Calgary. Great job for doing a survey and wanting to take in the feedback because they don't even do it just once a year. It's a, it's a twice a year sort of thing. It's a spring and fall. Um, every year and, and, and they update it. It's great. It's great information to have. But if you're going to always have to look at it and, and be a little bit critical and ask the right questions, because it could also be driving agendas, because maybe we're not asking the people that are paying the bills, we're asking the people that don't have as much input on it. So it, it, it's a very interesting sort of thing on the citizen satisfaction survey. For the, for the city of Calgary, who's probably totally listened to this podcast right now, please, please call me next year. I would love to do a survey. I've got time to spare. Come on. I've got 40 minutes on my, out of my day that I could sit and chat with you. And I'm, I'm the youngest of the, over the age of 18 in my household. So I am your clientele. So let's talk. Um, we well, you are, know what? They're very good about it too. If you have to go and they can't complete the survey, they will schedule a return call and call you back to finish the survey when you are available. Oh, Absolutely, they do a good job of that. Don't tell me that because after every question, be like, I gotta go now. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we are an hour and 20 minutes into this interview. Uh, we have covered a lot of topics tonight. Uh, or today, I should say, because this is airing in the morning, totally recording this in the morning as well. Awkward. Uh, before we go, is there any last minute uh, information you want to just, is there anything that we missed that you want to just briefly talk about? Um, no, I, we've covered a lot. I mean, we're going to see a lot going forward. We, we're, we're talking about, um, you know, the first days of this new administration or this new uh, elected council. Uh, and administration and how they're working with each other and and some things have been glaringly obvious already I think in, in terms of what we're going to see moving forward and you know some things are positive and some other things are questionable we'll say um so we'll see how it goes forward but I mean we have a lot of inexperienced people trying to find their footing and, and find their way so yeah. uh hopefully they they keep an open mind um and and i think they'll be better off and will be better off um uh, if they do that moving forward um because 
you know, if, if for no other reason, for their own self-preservation, because much like yourself, you mean you do a lot of political interviews and, and broadcasts, and there are people like myself with comments and opinions, and 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 there's lots of us out there uh, in the media, and we're and we're going to be questioning virtually everything they do. It's it's kind of our jobs. <laughs> exactly. <It's> a... <laughs> we are the tax. We are their taxpayers. We are their bosses. And at the end of the day, if they don't listen to us. Four years from now, they'll be looking for a job like a lot of the candidates who lost this election are doing right now as well. Um, exactly. Mike, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been a pleasure as always. We will have you back on the show for sure, maybe in January, February, depending on uh, your schedule. If you want to come back on and talk about the budget, we're happy to have you. Perfect. Uh, I, I'm available anytime. That's kind of one. I wear many hats with, with my business and uh, and then uh, as my foray into more public pub, as a public figure and, and into politics. And uh, I've kind of labeled myself now as a municipal observer and commenter. And uh, that uh, oddly makes up the acronym MOCK. Um, but uh, <laughs> but it's what but it's what we're going with uh, at this point. And uh, uh, like I say, kudos, kudos for uh, for some of the things that are happening. Um, you know, they, they they did approve the uh, the center, um, so you know that's something that needed to be done. I think given given the timelines and and uh, for those that weren't happy that they approved it, as a closing note, go back to your counselor that that got elected and see if in their commentary and in their platform if they were supportive of the event center or not. Um, it, it's kind of a litmus test because I know there were councillor candidates and I can't remember how many of them got elected who were against the uh, approval and the spending money on, on the new arena or the event center. So for voters, just as we did in our interview today, let's go back, have a look at your elected representative. Where did they stand on it? Did they were they pro or against? And if they were against, maybe ask them some questions because it just got approved. Amen to that. Um, uh, Mike, I want to thank you once again for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Uh, for my listeners, as always, uh, please tune in tomorrow for another great episode. It's a special edition. Uh, Sunday is Hanukkah. Uh, as uh, my household is celebrating Hanukkah, we will be talking Hanukkah tomorrow. So tune in for the history of Hanukkah and what it means to the Jewish faith and the community. Uh, also, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening to this on YouTube, on uh, Spotify, on Apple Podcast, all the fun stuff. The links are in the show notes. And if you uh, are feeling up to it, if you want to back the show to help the show continue, please go to patreon.com backslash cross border interviews, donate three, five, ten dollars a month as much as you possibly can to help the show continue. Uh, Mike, uh, once again, thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thanks, Chris. Look forward to our next conversation. Awesome. Anyway, everyone have yourself an excellent rest of your Thursday. And remember, keep talking. <laughs>